Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I have the pleasure to introduce uh, our speaker today, John Gold. Um, John is from Ireland. Uh, and he obtained his PhD in 2006 from University College in Cork. 2010. 2010. Okay. <laughs> and then he moved to Singapore for his first postdoc. Uh, and then back to Europe uh, with a Marie Curie fellow uh, in Oxford uh, for three years. Then you were five years in Italy at ICTP in Trieste. Uh, and then you went back to Ireland in 2018, right? Uh, with um, a fellowship from Royal Society. And in the same year you obtained uh, a ERC starting grant. Um, and is currently associate professor at uh, Trinity College in Dublin, um, where he's also a director of the Master in Quantum Science and Technology, and is the head of the research group in thermodynamics and energetics of quantum systems. Uh, well, John is a, an expert in thermodynamics, both uh, classical and quantum. Uh, I think he will. Give, give a, a talk about that today, and he's also an expert in uh, many body physics and quantum and classical simulation. Thanks a lot, Alberto. Yes. Yeah. So uh, yeah, thanks uh, very much uh, for the institute here for for inviting me. Um, I was supposed to come last year, but some stuff got in the way. Um, I've never been to Denmark before, so I'm enjoying myself here. I was telling Alberto yesterday that every Irish person around my age knows Aurus from a poem by Seamus Heaney, who's a famous Irish poet. He won the Nobel Prize in 1995. He wrote a poem called The Tolland Man, which is about these uh, preserved men, I think, that are in the museum here in Aurus. So I was thinking about that in the bus ride from the airport um, when he talks about the flatness of Jutland um, in the poem. But anyway, um, so yeah, I'm going to tell you all a little bit about um, something which I call quantum dual paddle buckets. Um, it sounds a bit weird, but actually it's uh, quite natural, um, mainly in the context of, of pure state um, thermodynamics, right? Um, but maybe I can just start off by telling you a little bit about my own group and what we're interested in, in case there's anybody else here that's interested in any of these topics and maybe wants to um, meet me to talk about any of them, since I'm here until tomorrow evening, essentially. So. We're a group that are kind of interested in the interface between, I would say, thermodynamics, many body physics, and quantum information loosely. So on the one side, we're interested in sort of the energetics of quantum information processing. So really, um, you know, as we kind of move into a, an era where quantum technologies are being, uh, you know, sort of developed at a rapid uh, pace, there's lots of interesting questions surrounding the physics of those devices, or at least you can construct physics as theorists inspired by those devices. And uh, then I guess uh, something which kind of bridges the gap with people like Alberto is that I'm also very interested in sort of stochastic thermodynamics as applied to quantum systems. And actually, uh, while the uh, classical stochastic thermodynamics is a very well-defined kind of topic, there's still fairly good scope for development in the quantum domain, um, mainly due to the you know, presence of coherence and energy eigenbasis and the invasive nature of quantum measurements poses problems from the interpretation perspective when you try to construct such a theory. And lastly, um, you know, we're interested in something that I want to talk about today, which I'm very interested in, which is the sort of uh, notion of uh, emergent thermalization and transport in, in many body systems, both kind of closed and open. So how do we understand the kind of emergence of thermodynamic quantities from, you know, sort of um, ev quantum evolution? Um, so sort of that fundamental question of emergence of statistical mechanics. And kind of recently as well, you see in the second part of the talk, the other thing that we became interested in um, mainly um, just out of curiosity is quantum simulation in general. So they're the kind of topics that we're interested in. So what I'm going to talk about in the first part um, is something which actually is motivated in 19th century physics. It's a dual paddle bucket that I'm going to tell you about in a second. Um, and because it's a kind of a colloquium and I'm assuming Basically, everybody is from a very different background. I'll give a fairly pedagogical, at least in my mind, pedagogical introduction to eigenstate thermalization. 
um, and then tell you a little bit about how we're using kind of dephasing thermometry to pose interesting questions regarding sort of emergence of, of temperature. So this work in the first instance was done by uh, Mark Mitchison, who was a postdoc in my group in Dublin, but now joined the faculty as an assistant professor. Uh, Marlon Brennis, who was a PhD student. Uh, he graduated last year and now moved to Toronto. Uh, Archak Purkayashta, actually, who spent a little bit of time in Aros before moving on to a faculty position in, uh, in India. So he was a postdoc at the time. And uh, Alessandro Silva from Trieste uh, in Italy. And although he wasn't involved in, in this work, um, a lot of the stuff on eigenstate thermalization I learned directly from Marcus Rigol, who's one of the kind of world experts in computational physics of sort of closed systems and emergence of thermalization. So I spent some time in Santa Barbara in 2018 and picked up a few things from him that we transferred across to our own work. OK, so what do I mean about motivation from 200 years ago? Um, I'm always kind of interested in the history of, of thermodynamics. Uh, and in the turn of the 19th century, believe it or not, um, we didn't really know uh, what energy was. There was no real concept of, of what energy was at all. They didn't have any good theory for it. Um, the prevailing idea at the time, this is pre-discovery kind of, of the first law of thermodynamics, was that heat was a kind of fluid, which they called the caloric. Uh, and it flowed kind of from hot to cold and, you know, um, they didn't really um, sort of see that you could convert mechanical work into heat yet. Um, and the first person who, not who noticed that there might be something more to it than the caloric theory was a guy called Rumford. So if you've ever been to Munich, you have the English gardens, so he established that. He was an American, actually. Um, and he was uh, tasked with the, with the kind of... Um, uh, task of organizing the Bavarian army in the first part of the, of the 19th century. And he noticed that huge amount of heat was generated while they were boring uh, holes in cannon guns. So they were making cannon guns by boring a uh, hole. And uh, he got very excited about that. And he started to devise his own apparatus, okay, which he took these cannon guns, immersed them in water, and uh, then developed a thermometer that he could actually read off the temperature of the water changing as they bored the hole in the cannon gun. Okay? And he wrote to the Royal Society with his findings. He actually was able to make the water boil, which was a big surprise for everybody that was sort of around Munich at the time, because the only, if you think about that time, the only time they would have seen boiling water was really when they lit a fire. right? So the guy was just boring a hole in the cannon gun and boiling water around his apparatus. It was a big deal. And you can see he wrote to the Royal Society, and he starts to say, look, the caloric theory, maybe it's not right. Actually, you know, heat is probably a form of motion. It was completely discredited. Uh, you go 25 years later, and Carnot wrote the paper on the heat engine. It was actually written in the language of the caloric, which is an incorrect theory, but the right answer came from it. So somebody who knew about Rumford's work, I read the paper recently, was about 50 years later, was James Joule. Okay? And James Joule designed uh, the uh, defining experiment of, uh, I would say, 19th century thermodynamics in the paddle bucket. It's an ingenious sort of idea. So he starts off his work by quoting Rumford, that you know, heat could be a form of motion. And he sets out a kind of operational way of, of measuring that. So you have some thermally isolated container. Okay? It has water in it. And then you have an apparatus which allows you to churn paddles. Okay? And uh, in churning the paddles, it lifts away, so you can measure the work done. And also, there's an in-situ thermometer, which he reads off a temperature change. Okay? So he was able to kind of confirm that you could, in an isolated system, you could really convert mechanical work into heat. Right? So the first law of thermodynamics was born out of Joule's experiments. He makes a big deal in the experiment saying that he could measure off from his mercury thermometers to three decimal points of accuracy. I'm not sure how much I believe him there. But uh, in any case, you know, you, you, it, you appreciate it now, but you know, in the referee report, actually, he called it originally the conservation of energy, but they said that was too radical and was taken out. So there's a referee who said, look, this is too radical to call this the conservation of energy. And uh, well, the rest is history. So kind of thermodynamics was born in a sense from this experiment. So that's what the paddle bucket experiment is. And we were kind of uh, interested in this uh, story, uh, but now, trying to interpret Joule's original experiment from the perspective of um, the Schrodinger equation. So how can we recover everything that Joule saw, just assuming quantum mechanics and Schrodinger equations? So no ensembles. There's, this is an isolated system, so I'm not assuming any you know, heat bat on the outside. So how we can get this from a closed system. Okay? And so this is the result of this paper here. 
And actually, it leads you to the idea of uh, how you take the temperature of a pure quantum state, which I'm going to tell you about. And this is connected to this thermometry business, which has become quite fashionable in the intersection between thermodynamics and quantum information community. Essentially, measuring temperature is a metrological problem. So it's like a parameter estimation problem in quantum mechanics. So let's break down the original experiment by Joule into three stages. So the first stage is the ability to perform um, and measure work in thermal isolation, okay? So defining that. The second part, which is a bit non-trivial, is the notion of relaxation. Inside in this thermally isolated container, you have to imagine some sort of ergodic postulate whereby, you know, sort of the, the fluid re-equilibrates or thermalizes to a new temperature, which corresponds to the initial energy density that's put in by moving the paddles. And then there's the important in-situ thermometry, right? So we want to try to get those three components into a quantum mechanical setting. So this notion of, you know, number two is the tricky one for quantum mechanics, and it's an old story. So how do you define thermalization in an isolated quantum system? And that question is sort of as old as quantum mechanics itself. It was posed by the likes of Schrodinger and von Neumann. You see these papers in 27 and 29, where people were trying to construct um, a sort of ergodic hypothesis in quantum mechanics. You know, if you open up a textbook and you see, you know, a statistical mechanics textbook, you know, classical, you know, the ergodic hypothesis is almost assumed at the start, right? There are some rigorous arguments, but they're kind of rare. They're phase space arguments, and of course, in quantum mechanics, we don't have the luxury of a well-defined phase space, okay? So uh, this is a problem, you know, in how you actually define uh, thermalization, right? Um, so a relatively, uh, you know, so since these papers, okay, I would say that it was a bit academic in the 20s and 30s. It was kind of strange. I mean, in the end, you can just open the window and you thermalize to the temperature of the room, right? So, but it started to become much more important with the development of AMO physics, whereby you know, we have now examples of many-body systems, um, unlike in condensed matter physics, which are you know, thermally isolated from you know, phonons for timescales that would be really unprecedented. Okay? And they're so well isolated that to a good approximation for very long timescales, you can model those systems of particles as um, obeying a Schrodinger equation up to some long timescale. And the first experiment actually done at the bottom here that sort of re led to a resurgence of interest in this old question of why or how uh, systems, quantum systems thermalize was this uh, experiment in the Dave Weiss group in Penn State. And actually it's the opposite. They found uh, when they trapped the one dimensional gas of bosons and the underlying Hamiltonian of such a system is called the lieb Lieninger model. It's bosons interacting with a delta function interaction in one dimension. It's uh, known to be integrable by the Beth ansatz and that means essentially that the system has an extensive set of conserved quantities, okay? And they noticed that if they, you know, did a quench, so they put a Bragg pulse in, and then they tracked the dynamics of the density, that the um, momentum distribution that they measured after a long time was not thermal, okay? And people said, okay, what's this about? And actually it makes sense that it's not thermal because it's an integrable system, it has an extensive set of conserved quantities. So it's not, it might be equilibrating, but it's not equilibrating to a standard uh, statistical mechanics ensemble. I mean, many, many other examples exist where this integrability can be broken. So there's this kind of dipolar Newton's cradle experiment whereby they can tune the system between being integrable and not being integrable, so they can observe standard thermalization. And now you can see you know, very well that if you perform quenches on generic uh, many-body systems, uh, if you look locally then uh, at an observable, okay, that observable appears at long times like it's thermalized at a temperature which is proportional to the initial energy density induced by the quench. Okay? I'll explain this in more mathematical terms next. So the question is, what is the mathematical apparatus or you know, framework to think about this type of uh, internal thermalization? Now again, this is really thermalization inside a many-body system in the laboratory, like an internal temperature that emerges. Of course, there's a temperature of the room and the temperature of the apparatus, but I'm really saying locally, what does the temperature of an observable look like if you assume the universe or your experiment is, is evolving according to the Schrodinger equation? Okay. So uh, the, the standard way of thinking about thermalization in isolated systems is the following. 
assume a large system, okay? Assume you have some Hamiltonian, uh, which is generic in the sense that it doesn't have any conserved quantities uh, other than the Hamiltonian itself. Let's just assume there's no degeneracies, okay? And take some initial state. That initial state can be trivial, if you like, and not an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian, so it's just some superposition in the eigenbasis. And now you're going to uh, see that, of course, uh, this coefficients are just the overlaps between the energy eigenbasis and the initial state. Um, and you're going to assume that that state has an extensive energy, which is reasonable in statistical mechanics. The energy scale is like n, okay, the number of particles. But you also want to assume that there's sub-extensive energy fluctuations in the initial state, okay? So in other words, the distribution of these coefficients, or the energy distribution of the initial state, is sharply peaked around the average energy, okay? So uh, again, these are the two assumptions. You have a large, three assumptions, large system, some spectrum, initial state with some extensive energy and sub-extensive energy fluctuations, right? So such a state you might generate from a quench, you could generate it from an arbitrary preparation in a simulator or whatever, okay? And uh, now what you want to do is you want to do time evolution according to that complex Hamiltonian, okay? So you do some time evolution and very quickly, if your system is generic, your initial product state, for example, will become entangled, right? And typically ergodic systems are not special systems. They typically have um, a behavior of the half chain or half system entanglement entropy, um, which scales roughly like T and then saturates to something like in a volume law. Okay, so scaling with the system size. So if I look at an observable, a local observable in such an evolution, I see behavior like this. If I do a numerical experiment or a real experiment, I'm going to see the observable, it's going to oscillate, okay? I make the system larger and I might see that these oscillations will start to settle down around this sort of average value. Just write out uh, the expectation value of the observable and you see that, you know, essentially you can split it up into the diagonal and off-diagonal matrix elements of the observable in the energy eigenbasis, so it's reasonable to assume that this type of behavior is dictated to, be, to you by the behavior of that observable in the energy eigenbasis of the Hamiltonian, okay? So what is this dashed value? This dashed value is nothing but the time average of the signal, which is the uh, expectation value of the observable as a function of time, and uh, if you make a time average of O of t, what you can see is that you kill off uh, the phases. So the off-diagonal contribution goes away, and you can accurately describe O average as sum over n modulus cn squared O and n, where O and n are the diagonal matrix elements in the energy eigenbasis. So this is known as the diagonal ensemble. So the diagonal ensemble is equivalent to, um, you know, defasing your state in the energy eigenbasis, which is equivalent to an infinite time average. So the expectation values of O here correspond to expectation values in this diagonal ensemble whose eigenvalues are the overlaps of your initial state with the energy eigenbasis of the Hamiltonian. Okay, is it all clear for now? Any questions? Good. So the question now of thermalization is the following. We know that uh, in the thermodynamic limit that O average, unless there's something very peculiar happening, will be described by the trace of O on the diagonal ensemble, but the question is, when can you replace now that diagonal ensemble, which contains a huge amount of information, with one of the ensembles of statistical mechanics, let's say the microcanonical ensemble, which is the most fundamental one, okay? So when can I get rid of all of that extra information in the diagonal ensemble and just replace it with a thermal expectation value? I mean, if we didn't have such a postulate in classical statistical mechanics, I mean, there wouldn't be much point in doing things. You need to make some simplifications. And when is it reasonable to do such a thing? And how do we understand that? Well, one of the ways that people understand that, that's very popular, is called the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis. So it's basically a beefed up version of random matrix theory with an energy dependence. It was, uh, the seeds lie in work by Michael Berry, um, and the formulation that I'm going to talk about, and which is widely accepted, uh, is by Mark Srenicki, who Actually, I talked with him and he said that the reason why he decided to come up with it was because he was teaching quantum statistical mechanics to graduates and he had no way of explaining thermalization, so he, he wanted to work backwards and come up with an explanation. So this, this is a hypothesis, there's no rigorous proof, and it tells you something, or it's a hypothesis on how the matrix elements of local observables in chaotic systems behave, okay? Um, 
And you see that there's two components, the diagonal component and the off-diagonal component. There's two different energy scales, the average energy, which is En plus Em over 2, and there's the frequency, which is Em minus En, right? So you see that the diagonal, okay, is essentially, uh, the, the, is postulated to be a smooth function of the energy. And the off-diagonal contributions, which I'll come to in a bit, a bit later, these have a prefactor which is exponential of the entropy at energy E, okay? which obviously is something which goes away okay, quite quickly as a function of L because it's 1 over the square root of density of states. Okay? And you have another smooth function on the off-diagonal, which we'll see later will govern correlation functions of the system. And you have this RNM, which is a random variable with zero mean and unit variance. Okay? So how does this explain this? This is the question. So this is a postulate. This is how the matrix elements of generic systems behave in the thermodynamic limit or for large systems. Well, to see how it works, think about that expectation value of the observable in the diagonal ensemble. So this looks like this. Eigenstate thermalization hypothesis tells you that the diagonal matrix elements of the observable in the energy eigenbasis become a smooth function of the energy. And that means we can tailor expand them about the average energy. So E here is the average energy, right? And that ever average energy, okay, is set by the only conserved quantity in the system, which is the energy of the initial condition. That's constant in time, right? So what you do is you perform a Taylor expansion of ONN, which according to the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis is a smooth function of the energy. Look at the first term. I put this in here now, okay, into the diagonal ensemble prediction. And you see that I can draw the CN squared times EN out. So this just becomes zero, right? I'm getting sum over N CN squared, EN, that's the average energy, minus the average energy, zero. So you're left with something which is basically the expectation value of the operator at energy E plus a term which is in the second derivative of the observable with respect to the energy. And notice that delta E squared is of order N again, but this thing here is of order 1 over N squared, so this thing is a 1 over N correction. Okay? So in the thermodynamic limit, you see that if I if I have eigenstate thermalization hypothesis, if it's true, if the, all that you require is that the diagonal matrix elements of observable in the energy eigenbasis becomes a smooth function of the energy, then that, that's actually enough to say that the diagonal ensemble prediction is equivalent to the microcanonical prediction, which is the value of the observable at energy E, and that energy is set by the energy density of the initial condition. Okay? So, the, the last, I mean, the, the other thing that you want to show is that the time evolution, the actual time evolution, should remain close to the average for most times, right? Because, you know, you could have that the average agrees, but there's wild fluctuations. And that's taken care of in the ETH, or the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis, by the fact that the off-diagonal matrix elements have this prefactor in E to the minus SE, right? So they're basically, um, the fact that the entropy is extensive with N, and this is an exponential, kills this off. So if you want to show that these time average um, of the temporal fluctuations of the actual observable about the average value die away as you make n large, you can just use some basic bounds to show that these things are bounded by e to the minus se, right, the fluctuations. So they're small as you increase the system size. And uh, you'll see a lot more of this uh, explained in more detail in, in this nice review here. Okay, so um, the last thing that I'd like to say about the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis is this function here. What is it? Fe of omega, right? Fe of omega, which we call the spectral function, is actually really where the magic of the ETH takes off. And what it tells you is something about fluctuations. If you're now not focusing on expectation values of the observable, but you're really focusing on two-point functions, so think about the connected correlator, on an eigenstate, right, what you can see is that the spectral function, the modulus squared of the spectral function, okay, evaluated on an, you know, will give you back the correlation functions that you know very well from condensed matter physics, like the symmetric response function or the Kubo response function. But the cool thing is, the ETH tells you that it's sufficient to evaluate these correlation functions on eigenstates, energy E, okay, 
with an energy which matches the energy of your initial condition in time evolution. So not only have you got thermalization at the level of the observable, okay, what the ETH also imposes is that the fluctuation dissipation theorem holds at the level of a single eigenstate. Okay? So this somehow is less studied than, obser than an observable thermalization, but it's an extremely important feature. How can you extract these things? How do you study these things? Well, you're dealing with a very complicated many-body system with no particular symmetry, so you're pretty much limited towards exact diagonalization. And uh, luckily enough, obviously, you just study matrix elements in the energy eigenbases that you do ED. But if you want to extract the smooth function of the energy F, which dictates the behavior of the correlation functions, what you can do is you can extract it by basically taking um, you know, binning essentially the matrix elements in frequency windows and continually changing the frequency, right? So this allows you to extract the modulus of F squared up to an energy dependent prefactor, right? This is just a numerical procedure. It's pretty straightforward when you think about it. What do they look like? So this is uh, computed in a spin chain with some integrability breaking terms I get to more detail. These are the matrix elements as a, sc a scatter plot, and here's the kind of running average of this thing, right? So you just bin it into different frequency windows. And this black line, okay, is this uh, smooth function on the off diagonal matrix elements. And what you can do then is you can take that and you can build the standard response functions of whatever operator that you're interested in. So this is, for example, in a staggered field model. This one is the uh, symmetric response function, this one is the Kubo response function. Obviously these things are interesting also because you can measure them experimentally, right? So the temperature that you get here is the temperature that you would compute in the microcanonical ensemble. So the derivative of the entropy with respect to the energy, the inverse of that, okay? You can use this thing to study like Fisher information because the Fisher information can be recast in terms of response functions. I don't want to talk about that. It's a work that we've done before. Um, but what I'd really like to talk to is a go back to this idea of the dual paddle bucket. So we're going to put a non-integrable uh, many-body system that fulfills the ETH as our water in Joule's paddle bucket, and we're going to perform an in silico experiment numerically exactly like he did on a computer. So this is the model. So this is the Heisenberg model in the staggered magnetic field. You can see this field in the Z direction breaks the integrability. Okay, so it's known to break all of the conserved quantities of the XXZ. Um, and it's known to be diffusive, obeys ETH, etc. So if you look in the matrix elements of this model, okay, as a function of the, this is, this is basically as a function of the energy density, this is the diagonal matrix elements. What you see in the main plot, <coughs> the, the scatter plot, are the matrix elements as a function of the system size. And you can see as you increase system size, you're shrinking. Okay, and this black line is the microcanonical prediction for a given observable A, right? So this is what you do when you do a scatter analysis of matrix elements. On the right hand side, you see <clears throat> on this semi-log plot, extraction of Fe of omega at different E's. So different E's correspond to different thermalization temperatures. And what you notice is that the sort of higher frequency stuff is totally insensitive to you changing the energy density, but the low frequency part of the correlation function is what seems to be sensitive um, to changing the temperature. So this is going to form the basis of our thermometry scheme in a little bit. Okay? So just to show you that ETH fulf is fulfilled naturally in this model. Now what we're going to do is we're going to start in the ground state of this model, okay? and we're going to turn on uh, or stirring our paddles, okay, by just modulating a single spin in the center of the chain. So we're just going to pump um, energy into the system just by periodically modulating one of the spins. Okay, so you see here a plot of the energy as a function of time in what we call the preparation stage. So this is stirring the, the paddle, okay? Start at zero energy, the ground state, okay? And you start to um, increase the energy by just um, essentially stirring this for different time scales. So if I stop the modulating field at any point in time, I fix the energy that I'm now then going to do free evolution with. Okay? So what's shown down here is the energy distribution yeah, at, for a given preparation corresponding to an average energy of minus 8j, where j is the hopping. So that means I've stopped somewhere here. Okay? And that gives me a
something to different preparations in time here, right? So if you want, the black line is a lower temperature. So you go towards zero energy, that's higher temperature, okay? It's a bit confusing, but density of states is sort of Gaussian around, peaked around zero energy, and the high temperature states are in the center of the spectrum, right? So, um, but you can see the higher temperature states you rapidly equilibrate, okay? The lower temperature ones are taking a bit of time. So what's shown here as the, at the dashed line is the prediction from the diagonal ensemble. Okay, so this is the equilibration time when, for this observable, when this red line touches the dashed line, that's the equilibration time. And how do we know <coughs> that that corresponds to thermalization? Well, we can compare different initial energy preparations and the microcanonical prediction. So what you show here in the black dots are predictions from the time average against the microcanonical prediction, and you can see statistical mechanics works very well. The cool thing is, of course, remember that in this experiment, we're never leaving the assumption of a closed system. We're just looking locally at some observable, right? So, I mean, if you want to call that an open system, fine, but globally, you're just evolving according to the Schrodinger equation. And what I'm showing here on the uh, right and left is just uh, the behavior of the correlation functions, okay? Just to show that the fluctuation dissipation theorem is also holding. So this is a sort of preparation. So I'm performing work. This is essentially performing work, mechanical work, by stirring the, the system, measuring the work distribution, and then allowing for relaxation. And that relaxation, or thermalization, depends on how long you've stirred for, okay? So that's the idea of this paddle bucket. And the last thing really to think about is how you can do in situ thermometer, thermometry, okay? And actually the way in which we do in situ thermometry is uh, there's a number of different ways you can do that, but we choose to do Ramsey interferometry. So what we do is we take this time evolving state, this many body system that's evolving in time, we know that it's equilibrated and thermalized to the correct temperature. We want to try to read out that temperature, which is set by the energy that you've pumped in. So we couple in an ancillary qubit, which uh, couples in a spin dependent way. So when the ancilla is in state up, Okay, the, it sees, it kicks the, the many body system, and if it it's state down, it doesn't see it at all. So if you want, it's a Ramsey interferometer, um, and we choose an interaction with our ancilla, which commutes with the system Hamiltonian, which means it preserves the energy of the ancilla. So really, you're just affecting the off diagonal matrix elements of the ancilla, right? And uh, from that dephasing signal, yeah, we want to try to read out the temperature, right? So it sounds like a bit. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, fast forward, but like it's something that's done fairly routinely. I was only talking to Jan about it today in ultra cold gases. So this is an experiment from Rudy Grimm with impurities in, uh, in, in Fermi gases. Uh, and they can do this Ramsey interferometry scheme by means of tuning feshbach resonances so they can really read out the dephasing of embedded impurities in gases, right? So the question is, how is the dephasing yeah, connected to the temperature that you're equilibrating to. So I'm probing, an equi I'm, pr I'm probing an equilibration temperature here. So in order to do this, you have to do a little bit more work, right? So again, here's the Hamiltonian. This is the Hamiltonian of my dual paddle bucket, if you want, my spin chain. This is the interaction Hamiltonian of my, of my, of my spin. And uh, I prepare my ancilla in plus, and what I do then is I notice that <clears throat> The off diagonal matrix elements, when I trace out the many body system, are just given to you by this sort of low Schmidt amplitude, whereby uh, you have an evolution corresponding to a perturbed evolution. Here, psi zero is not the initial state of the many body system, it's actually the state after it sort of equilibrates, because you're trying to probe the emergent temperature scale. And what you can do then is you can assume that the ancilla is weak in weak coupling. You don't have to, but if you do, you can do a little bit more. You can perform a cumulant expansion of this object. And what you see is in that long times, yeah, this thing is dominated by the zero frequency component of the Fourier transform of the autocorrelation function of the interaction Hamiltonian, right? So if you assume, for example, that the interaction Hamiltonian is coupling via sigma z, this thing probes the zero frequency component of the Fourier transform of that correlation function. And remember that it's precisely the low frequency part of the correlation function that I showed you, which is, which is sensitive, okay, to the energy, right, to the temperature. 
So, so what, we've, what you can see is that chaotic systems, they generically display finite DC noise, right? And that leads to a pure exponential decay with temperature dependent rate, okay? So you can find details in, in some of these papers. So how good is this? So for example, um, unfortunately what you'd be hoping for, because when you make a thermometer, right, you want to have some very well defined property of your system that you can gauge the temperature from. Think about a mercury thermometer. I mean, what good is a thermometer if you don't know how your probe, your physical properties of your probe are vary, varying with temperature? So you first have to make a model. So what we find is that although the exponent of the exponential decay in the dephasing okay, is uh, linear in the energy density, this translates to a non-linear dependence of the temperature, which is a little bit disappointing. What you'd be hoping for is something like a linear dependence of the temperature to really make a good thermometer. However, um, all is not lost. Uh, and the problem is we can only do numerics in one dimension, okay? because these are very complicated uh, exact diagonalizations. But you can make a hydrodynamic argument that I don't really want to go into, which was sort of first uh, you know, kind of made to us by Alessandro Silva, which shows you if you were in three dimensions, weak coupling, then actually the exponent would be linear with temperature. It's just a peculiarity of the way that the hydrodynamics work in one dimension that doesn't give you a linear behavior with the temperature. So what are the pros? So this works for kind of generic ETH obeying systems in arbitrary thermal preparations. It does not require fine-tuned energy levels like other thermometry schemes. Um, the cons are that it requires knowledge of temperature dependent DC noise. So you need to know if you want to make a temperature or thermometer. If you, if, you need to, if you want to make a thermometer, you need to know how the property of some part of your system behaves with temperature. I mean, that's how you make a thermometer. I mean, uh, you really need to have a good model. Right? Um, the open questions are, we, don't really, we didn't really explore the precision bounds, so with the Fisher information in a metrological sense or anything like that. You know, what is the role of measurement back action when you actually really go and you measure off the ancilla, you're probably doing something to the gas. Um, that you're immersed in, and can you improve the readout uh, by using multiple probes? Um, I actually have a few more slides. I don't know how much time I have left. Okay, fine. Let me quickly tell you another thing about pure state preparation. So that was like thermometry. There's another useful application of pure state thermodynamics, and uh, we recently were doing some experiments with Nathan Keenan, who's a PhD student in my group, who's actually employed by IBM. The advantage of having somebody employed by IBM is that they have access to the full stack. So we were using this uh, coupled Trasmon device called Montreal, okay, to do some interesting experiments or simulation of spin chain model, okay. So what's the idea? Again, we take this uh, Heisenberg chain, and this Heisenberg chain, I'm not breaking the integrability, so it's really an integrable system. And at high temperatures, the transport properties of the Heisenberg model are extremely well characterized, right? So it's known, for example, as a function of this anisotropy, how, how spin is transported. So spin is conserved in the model. So for example, when delta is less than one, you have a ballistic transport. When delta is greater than one, you have diffusive. And at delta equal to one, it's known that this model has super diffusive, uh, funny super diffusive transport, which means you get a uh, current which scales like 1 over L to the Z minus 1 where Z is 3 over 2 or a spin-spin correlation that goes like T to the 1 over Z. Yeah? And these exponents are connected. So these, this was known that this funny transport behaves. Now what is super diffusion? Super diffusion that finite size looks, looks like it's diffusion but in the thermodynamic limit it looks ballistic. Right? So just like subdiffusion, which is also anomalous diffusion it's the opposite, right? It looks diffusive at finite system size, but in the thermodynamic limit, the transport goes to zero, okay? So um, it's been conjectured recently, okay, by uh, Snederich, Prosen, and other people, that the origin of this super diffusion is because the correlation functions in this model fulfill an equation called the cardar parisi zhang equation, which describes surface growth in classical statistical physics, right? It's not proven analytically, it's a conjecture. So this funny exponent is coming from some underlying emergent universality at high temperatures at this particular point in the phase diagram. Um, and, and by now there's actually considerable 
um, experimental proof quite recently that this is the case. So there was a pump probe experiment, traditional pump probe experiment in neutron scattering where they measure essentially S of omega at low frequencies again, okay, by neutron scattering. And uh, they try to extract the exponent from the, ex the, the fit at high temperatures and they see something quite close to this 3 over 2 value. And in the Manuel Bloch's group uh, in cold atoms, they sort of prepared initial preparations of, of, of domain walls and look at the evolution of domain walls to extract from the sort of population transfer this exponent as well, and they get close to this Carter Prezi Zhang exponent. So we were thinking, is there a way of doing this on a um, intermediate scale device, right? So on one of these coupled Trasmon, if you want early stage quantum computers, would we be able to see something like that exponent? And at first glance, you know, you'd think this is crazy because transport requires quite large system sizes and long time scales, which are precisely the type of things that's not very easy to do with a quantum computer, but you can do some tricks. So what tricks can you do? So what, we play a funny game. So we take the device, yeah? Um, and what we do is we, we use this qubit that we know is good. It's good in the sense that the readout errors are very small. We know that just from looking at the, at the, the numbers on the device. And we, the first thing that we do is like a dual paddle bucket, except now to infinite temperature, is we just make a random circuit. So what we do is we apply a random layer of single qubit gates on all qubits. So we choose from root of x, root of y, and t. Okay? And then we do a layer of c naughts in a particular sequence, we repeat not applying the same single qubit gate that we applied in step one, and we keep going. And what you can do is you can plot the entanglement entropy in theory, okay, of half this device, and you can see that you saturate the maximum possible value after around 20 layers. So it's, it's quite good as a randomizer. It's not true randomness in the sense of har, okay, but it'll, it's enough to generate this big superposition in the computational basis, which would be reflective then when you do dynamics of very high temperatures. So what you see here is that we leave one of the qubits untouched, completely untouched, while we randomize everything else. So this is actually a shot of the magnetization following the circuit on the actual device. So what you see is you get this uh, magnetization profile, which is one of the qubits is polarized and the rest are in this mess. Okay, that's what it is. That's actually off the hardware. The cool thing is about this procedure is we know from, you know, from numerical work is you can use a completely random state to compute a correlation function at infinite temperature. So this is this typicality trick. So what we're doing is using this as initial state, okay, and then we're going to do a propagation via trotterization on top, okay? So the cool thing is, is that the kicked XXZ model, so if I, if I think about continuous time evolution, right, I need lots of trotter steps to, to mimic continuous time evolution. But actually, what's known is that the Cardar Parisi Zhang universality also holds in discrete time. So if I go to first order in Trotter, I get something which is like a Floquet problem, known as the kicked XXZ model. So if you want, it's just a brickwork circuit where I have two qubit gates acting on even and odd sites. The, the, the advantage of that is you can take arbitrary large Trotter steps and you define a kind of Floquet problem. So what we're going to do is we're going to start to apply this circuit which represents the discrete time XXZ or the kicked XXZ model on top of this initial random preparation. Okay, so we do that and uh, we see if we can extract something from um, the, the device. So again, just to summarize what we're doing, and I'll finish in a second, we create a random circuit on L minus one qubits, we leave one qubit alone, right? We then take the XXZ model and we break it down to first order in Trotter, that defines a Floquet problem, okay? Each uh, Trotter step on two qubits is a circuit like this, is well known, right? How you simulate the XXZ model. And uh, then we just start hitting it with Trotter steps, okay? This random preparation. Now, I still don't understand why this random state preparation works so well, uh, as you'll see in a second, but my my feeling is that it's, if something is messed up enough, the noise locally on the device, it doesn't really care too much about it, right? So if you think about a random state locally, if I trace out a few qubits, 
I look locally, I'm going to see something equivalent to the identity. So it's kind of invasing, it's in, invariant under dephasing channels in some sense, local dephasing channels anyway, such a preparation, except for qubit one, okay? So we do this, and uh, what you see is for 21 qubits, we don't use all the qubits under the 27 qubit device. So what this is a plot of the measured correlation function. So the black line is a minus two over three fits, so that's what you expect at the super diffusive point. The gray line is classical trotter evolution on a classical computer, okay? And the green line is what we got from the device, right? So pretty good. It follows without any error mitigation. Yeah, it's following the what you'd expect. We can then break the integrability, okay, by adding a stagger magnetic field, which amounts to another layer of gates in the z direction, right? And then you'd expect this two over three exponent to go to the diffusive exponent of a half. And what you see is, you know, again, something which looks pretty good. Now you could argue that maybe it's not exactly that, it's curve fitting, whatever, but it's promising. And it's pretty difficult working with these devices usually to get results off them. So we were very happy about that. So we are currently working, pushing the boundaries on this a little bit further, looking at slightly different discrete time models and you know, using sort of these tricks to extract some exponents, et cetera. So again, randomize, you get this preparation on all qubits except one. This represents a density perturbation in a, in a kind of a homogeneous background, which then evolves with time under the Trotter evolution. And you check how that density profile is evolving with time, and that will give you information on the correlation function according to the theory, right? So that's the idea. So for this part and conclusions in general is that we simulated the local infinite temperature spin spin autocorrelation function of the XXE model for 21 qubits. You could simulate for long enough to get some hydrodynamic information, which was actually surprising to us. Um, it seems that discrete time and the random state preparation are crucial. Um, and we're currently working on pushing that out to larger system sizes uh, using error mitigation and some other models. Uh, that's what we're doing at the moment with that. So with that, I'd like to thank you and I'll happily take any questions from anybody.